much for coming out to this event. My name is Robin Whitaker and I teach in the anthropology department at MUN here and uh, the, our department is one of the co-sponsors along with uh, political science of this event tonight. So I'm just going to say a little bit about the event and the format and then um, my colleague Sarah Martin is going to take over as moderator uh, and we'll get pretty quickly to the panelists because we want to have lots of time for discussion. So. Um, as you all probably know, since you're here, what we wanted to do tonight was just to uh, have space for a conversation about what we all think we need to have happen to get the Muskrat Falls, the public inquiry into Muskrat Falls, to have the best possible option um, for this province. And, you know, uh, I... <laughs> I guess there are some diversity of views on, on the project, but whatever people think about it, we all have an interest in making sure that the inquiry gives us positive guidance for the future, and that's really what the focus of the event tonight is, is on. Um, so the way the event will run, oops, oh, I think we're getting connection to Labrador. <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, great. In the of <laughs> we'll just wait for this. <laughs> While this is happening, I'll just mention that the closest bathrooms are out the door, turn left, and then through the left, the glass doors on the left. So this is uh, gym learning being set up at the Labrador Institute. We had uh, technical problems with Plan A. Okay. Hi, Jim. Hi, Robin. How are you? Good. How are you? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Carrying on. <laughs> Um, so we will begin with um, each panelist's assessment of the setup of the inquiry, um, its terms of reference, and what the panelists each think is missing from those terms, and what needs to happen so that we do get that best possible outcome that we all want. The opening statements will be short. Um, Katie, who's right there, is going to be ruthlessly keeping time um, to make sure everyone sticks to their 10-minute li limit. So we'll have lots of time for discussion afterwards. Um, we also ask that audience members respect the fact that there are a lot of people wanting to make contributions and ask questions tonight. So please be concise. And um, as we know, Muskrat Falls can trigger strong emotions in people. So please make sure that your engagement here is respectful with other audience members and with the panelists. Um, we do also have um, an email account set up, so we'll be interspersing the questions from in this room with some emailed questions as well. The event is being um, webcast, so we should be getting uh, participation from all across the province. Um, so lastly, I'd like to note that we did invite Natural Resources Minister Siobhan Cody to participate tonight or send a delegate. Um, she declined. However, her department and the Department of Justice did give the panel and the organizers an extensive briefing and discussion on Friday. And I'd like to thank in particular uh, John Cowan, Diana Quinton, and Keith White in Natural Resources, and Ian Tucker from Justice. They really spent a lot of time talking to us. I think we derailed their briefing somewhat, but it was a really interesting morning. Um, before I turn things over to Sarah, I need to thank also the Departments of Anthropology and Political Science for hosting the event and the Labrador Institute for uh, hosting Jim Learning. The Harris Center and Janet Heron helped get the word out. Uh, Darcy Andrews at the back here has been our technical wizard. <laughs> um, he's from the Center for Innovation in Teaching and Learning here at MUN. Uh, Carrie Claire Neal, Katie Duff, John Duff, and Jody Greenleaves all were part of the organizing team along with myself and Sarah and of course the four panelists I'll just mention their names because Sarah is going to introduce them briefly as they uh, speak Elizabeth Davis Jim learning Steve Tomlin and David Vardy and uh, panelist biographies are available on the handout at the front if people didn't get them and want to pick one up when they leave okay thanks very much good evening everyone Terrific to see everyone out here. I'm honored to be uh, introducing the panelists uh, for, the int uh, for the evening. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Davis. She is the congressional leader of the Sisters of Mercy of Newfoundland and Labrador. Good evening, everyone. 
I first recognize the land on which we are meeting as the ancestral home of our, Mi of our Beothuk, Mi'kmaq, and Halapu peoples, and the land and sea about which we're talking, the ancestral home of the Innu, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We do not inherit the land from our parents. We borrow it from our children. These words from the Inuit elders must echo through the work of the inquiry on the Muskrat Falls project. This project had an admirable vision when it began, meeting the province's long-term energy needs by providing clean, renewable energy for future generations. But the way to that vision seems to be failing tragically. This inquiry established by government in response to the concerns of us, the people of the province, has the potential to help the province find a new way forward. One that we may not meet the original vision, but certainly could salvage the best possible outcomes given the situation we are now in. The terms of reference of the inquiry as we now have them could appear to focus solely on costs and transparency of the past. However, if the inquiry is to truly respond to our concerns, it must not look back only. It must also look forward to ongoing costs and ongoing risks. If it does not, it will be a waste of time and a waste of money it will be the loss of an opportunity to help redirect something which seems to be going in the wrong direction. Article 4D of the Terms of Reference speaks about risks and problems. And Article 6 speaks about findings and recommendations. These two articles do give the possibility of an interpreting the terms of reference more broadly to include what I believe to be three major ongoing concerns. An incredibly high debt load, continuing environmental damage, and ongoing social consequences to the operating of the generating plant. An incredibly high debt. We have already been told that in order to help pay down that debt, residential electricity rates will significantly rise and may even double. And even more, that money will have to be taken from the usual expenditures of our government. The um, incredibly high rates will affect every person, every family, and every business in this province. The reduction of services will affect whom it always affects, the poorest among us, the children among us, the sickest among us, and the oldest among us, the most vulnerable people in this province. Ongoing environmental damage. Reputable researchers have consistently pointed out that the damage already done to the land and the waters with the work already completed is not the end of the environmental risks. They point to two ongoing major areas of concern. Methylmercury and its impact on water sources, wildlife and the health of people, and dangers to the stability of the North Spur, that large natural dam with its unique glacial clays. There is a universally accepted principle, the precautionary principle, which relates to environmental degradation. First used at the Earth Summit in 1992, a summit uh, pr presented by the United Nations, that precautionary principle says that if there is objective evidence showing that serious and irreversible damage may result, a project should be halted or modified, even without indisputable proof. If this inquiry is to have any positive impact on these serious environmental concerns, 
Given the critical timelines of the project, the commissioner will have to have an interim report if we are going to help prevent that damage continuing to happen. Ongoing social consequences. The people at most risk here are the people who live near and on the Churchill River itself. They have been speaking out in their own voices about the destruction now and into the future, some indeed having been imprisoned for making those voices known. But the spirits and hopes of all Newfoundlanders and Labradorians will be diminished if the people of the river are diminished. And every single Newfoundlander and Labradorian will be affected by the crippling debt that seems to be coming, we're going to inherit. Doubled electricity rates and reduced health, education, and social programs will lead to higher numbers of people in this province desperately needing services which they will not be able to get. Should the feared outcome of bankruptcy come to reality, the social consequences are beyond belief. We, have, we, the ordinary citizens of this province, have absolutely no evidence that a structure or a system is being developed to help mitigate these social consequences, which surely will happen. If the commissioner, in preparing his inquiry, chooses to ignore these ongoing risks and looks only to the risks that have already happened, then the people will not be well served by the inquiry. Indeed, right now, this inquiry seems to be the only option people like us have to speak to this problem. It seems to be the only option we have to make sure a path that seems to be going in the wrong, wrong direction is at least slightly moved to the right direction. If the commissioner is to do what I believe the commissioner must do, there are two pieces to his inquiry that he must incorporate. The first is citizen engagement, and the second is creating a network of diverse groups with like interests. Citizen engagement is not simply saying, you can speak to me if you wish. Citizen engagement is about facilitating processes, ways of participating that allow the most ordinary of us citizens to find our voice. Without that step, the voices will not be heard. With that step, we have a real possibility of having our voices heard and of moving away from this terrible track we seem to be following. By himself, the commissioner and his inquiry cannot turn back around the Mus Muskrat Falls uh, project. But what he can do, if he does it correctly, is create a network of groups and people with diverse perspectives, but all interested in the health of the land and the health of the people. We are becoming more familiar today with a concept called social license. Social license is rooted in the belief that people should have a say over what affects them. It's rooted in a belief that the voices of the people should be taken into account when major projects like this are being developed. Just think of the positive change that this commissioner and his inquiry could achieve if he brought together indigenous peoples, businesses, professions, the voluntary sector, academic researchers, religious organizations, activists, journalists, and ordinary everyday citizens, all focused on one thing, taking something that could threaten our very future in most fundamental ways and turning it into something that would be for the good of this province. Having served on a royal commission in this province of three people, I have a lot of empathy for the commissioner who was a sole commissioner. I encourage him not just to listen to the voices of experts in finance and administration and construction, but equally to listen to the voices and to seek the advice of those who are, have another interest, the environmentalists, 
the social scientists, and most of all, the people of this province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Much has been lost already, but there is hope that a new way can be found, and that we will truly hear the words of the Inuit elders. We do not inherit the land from our parents, we borrow it from our children. This is my plea to the commissioner. Do not look to the past solely to clarify the historical record. Rather, look to the future and become the catalyst for the redirection of this project for the health of the people of the river, for the health of the people of Newfoundland and Labrador, and for the health of the land and the waters that we call home. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Elizabeth. Uh, I now would like to introduce Jim Learning, who's an active member of the Labrador Land Protectors. Jim. It's terrifying. I thought I was going to get to go last, so I could sum up what everybody else was saying. It looked like I knew I was talking to I think that's not going to happen. Uh, Sister Davis, uh, that's amazing that with one single line, you've expanded this, uh, put the possibility up there to expand this commission into something that will create awareness amongst the population that apparently is not there. And I, I say, for the few of us who are fighting this, we're beginning to look maybe a little stark. And we're beginning to feel a little stark and outnumbered. Because a lot of people who uh, will be affected by this it, it isn't talking, and that's that's really worrisome. So, in spite of Dave and um, uh, Dan Sullivan, Dave Riley, Dale Sullivan, and all the others there in St. John's, Cabot Martin, Maurice Adams, who have been crowing about this since day one, it, it's not having an effect. And I'm glad that this forum has come to the social media, because the social media, whether you like it, love it or hate it, it's a connection to everybody. Sometimes it's just a connection to their breakfast, who cares? <laughs> but when it's a connection to our politics and a connection to our welfare, I'm in, and I hope they will, and the rest of them will, will be in there as well. I see most of them, I don't see Dave, but uh, he's a force to be reckoned with, as Sister Elizabeth uh, is as well, and, and I'm, I'm really, I feel, I just feel like, we can relax here now. It's it's in good hands because being downstream from this project and having uh, an emotional attachment to what was the river that I grew up on and then the rest of the kids around me, so the kids to me now, uh, they have to feel that they've been betrayed by this, even though they have to work there, get a job, otherwise they don't get their unemployment. It's a, it's a very unprincipled... Uh, way to have to go, to, to go to work over there when you're feeling that you're doing something wrong, but you feel like you have to take the job. That is so unfair. And of course, this whole project speaks to the fact that it's, a, to me, a gigantic uh, make work program and a welfare program. It, it's horrible. Anyway, I, like I say, I do feel good that all of a sudden that there's this evidence of involvement now, given you people coming on side and trying to engage this uh, social media, I think that can be a formidable force if we try to move ahead with it, move ahead with it and make sure it's effective. Uh, it will be if we can move ahead with it because it, people just do, they do engage with social animals. And I feel the government of Newfoundland and pushing this project forward is, they've deserted us in terms of it's unethical, it's immoral, and it's no integrity. And to me, those three pillars of, those three pillars are based on fairness. We see no fairness when we look around and we see the massive populations just coming in again to, to wash over Labradorians, to take away a river, or take away a mine, or fish camp, whatever. Every time we really turn around, for those of us who care, something is going away. And we all care. It's just some of us are more vocal about it than others. And of course, that makes, I have to tell you, that makes the average Labradorians stick out and feel a little uncomfortable. The more upfront I get, I know the more uncomfortable I get. But having said that, uh, in this, with this project, the more upfront I get, the more 
I, I tell you what, the more determined I become that this has to be fixed. And I, I, I applaud this Sister Elizabeth in saying that uh, and finding the benevolent side of this, uh, finding a way to, to make it look good for everybody. Instead of, the rest of us just want to throw everybody involved in in jail. But no, she takes the tact that everybody is salvageable. Of course, she would. She's a very principled lady, and her, her work tells us that's what she does. And, and I think that is the way to go. So I have to suddenly want to try to staunch my, my what you would call, very resentment to this project. And my loyalty for the new Indian government to bring it on. Uh, I'm, I'm making this sound like a very personal thing, but I think a lot of people out there share my sentiment. I, I hope they do. So, uh, not, there's a lot of detail I can get in here to here, but I'm not going to do it. I didn't prepare a speech. This is just off the cuff because I, I'm not a, a speaker anyway. I just respond to the situation the best I can. And I looked at this for a long time, so I can respond to just the main corner of it, uh, repeating what I read, of course. So I'm going to cut my time short and say thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks very much, uh, Jim. Uh, now I'm, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Stephen Tomlin. He's a professor in the Memorials Political Science Department. Stephen? I'm taller. <laughs> I'm honored uh, to be here uh, and see such a big crowd, obviously. Uh, this time of year, people are, are busy with their lives and, and carrying out uh, all kinds of responsibilities. I also must admit, when we were first discussing this panel, uh, my daughter was in labor. <laughs> And so I, I wasn't sure about, about the time and the day Vardy had uh, appeared in, in my classroom and this, this kind of uh, came to fruition uh, very quickly. But it's nice to see the engagement, have communities together and, and see some familiar faces and people on Twitter and elsewhere. Um, we did meet with the government and uh, uh, Sister Elizabeth uh, Davis um, set the tone. So, so I'm going to be as optimistic as I can tonight, and I'm also going to try to keep it within, within 10 minutes, which is a very difficult thing for any academic uh, to do, uh, and particularly for, for yours truly. Um, so we have the, the, the overhead. Um, I'm optimistic. I'm not necessarily suggesting that it has to be a dog and, and pony show. I hope it is transformation. I think you know, royal commissions provide an opportunity to have you know, change and transformation, to think and, and rethink. But most of all, of course, it provides an opportunity to develop, to create knowledge resources, to create the linkages, um, to think uh, critically about how can we better engage so that we can define issues or problems and come up with ways to evaluate, constantly evaluate, to, uh, to ensure that the community needs are, are being met. So royal commissions um, do occur from time to time. And they, they do provide an opportunity. They, they tend to be, again, a, a reaction to crises or, or, or failure. Uh, but I think, I think that's something that we need to take into account. How can we actually make this beast something which is going to be fulfilling, which is going to you know, change, transform, um, set us in a very, very different direction? It may not necessarily solve the challenges or problems around Muskrat Falls as, as a project. That's my cynic side. Um, but we can use this again to, to achieve other, other things. Um, my next slide. Why are we here? Um, again, how is it? Why is it that people launch these kinds of inquiries? Um, first off, it's, it's a response or the reaction to a, a crisis, a political crisis. It's a response or reaction to political failure. We haven't been very effective in the past, and the political parties have not been very effective in the past in terms of ad identifying, addressing, or dealing with, with, with some of our needs and, and priorities. Royal commissions tend to be catalysts for change uh, in order to, to, again, create an opportunity to reflect, to think about what was done in the past, what was done badly, and, and, and to improve it. Um, the other challenge or problem, I think, associated with Muskrat Falls is a series of knowledge gaps, um, either deliberate or not. 
but there was a series of knowledge gaps having to do with the impacts in terms of the ecology. This is green energy, again, in many of the United States, um, you know, in terms of their rules or regulations, they don't always consider hydro as, as green. So, so it's a fight. Um, but there are significant gaps, I think, in terms of the shale gas or the technology or, or the engineering. Um, so again, I think we need to understand and recognize um, that whether it's energy needs or, or U.S. rules or shale or, or, or volatility in terms of the ongoing changes which are occurring within the United States associated with the shale gas revolution, um, we didn't see it. We didn't anticipate it. Um, and if you're going to put all of this effort into building new forms of energy and infrastructure around it and the costs which are, which are considerable, we need to have an understanding of what's, what's happening uh, at our, you know, in, in our neighbors next door or, or in other jurisdictions, including, including uh, you know, the Maritimes, including Quebec. So I think we need to understand and recognize that there are significant knowledge gaps which were not identified, that, you know, there wasn't enough contestation and enough evidence gathering. A, a lot of, again, the, the needs, the things that need to be done in order to effectively define issues or problems. So I think that, that that is uh, uh, why, partly why we're here, that we're trying to figure out where did these knowledge gaps, why didn't we know, why, why did we make these, these decisions, and so on and so forth. We also know that there's, I think, significant pressure to do something. I think when the government first got elected, they can understood and recognized. It took them a long time to do that. They tended to more kind of react day to day as opposed to be more pro proactive. But I think, I think there is this kind of sense of frustration and desire to identify what are those institutional gaps? What are the, the things which have gone on in the past? How can we fix it? How can we improve it? How do we engage? Can, what, what forms of, of engagement uh, are, are required uh, or, or necessary? Problems or solutions. Um, one of the challenges I think we have is that we have a commissioner uh, who does not have a background in energy. That doesn't necessarily mean that that is going to prevent us from exploring and, and you know, transforming or, or, or changing. Um, but I think there are going to be challenges or problems, particularly if that commissioner is designing the, the questions, the research questions, constructing the, uh, you know, and Put, putting into play the mechanisms in terms of addressing or dealing with things which need to be addressed. Um, if we had, you know, a crisis in terms of family law, would we want to have somebody with a background in energy? Would, wouldn't people find that, that, that puzzling or, or confusing? So I think that's part of the challenge or problem, as I see it, in terms of the, the terms of reference and in terms of how this thing is, is being uh, set up. Uh, in terms of the, the reference, in terms of the terms of references themselves, there's a lot of things that are missed. So again, the, the if the challenge is knowledge construction or, or, or good knowledge construction and the creation of new knowledge resources and the, and the creation of knowledge communities, um, we don't see very much, I don't think, yet on um, things like U.S. regulations or the, or the role of the executive branch and the connections with NALCOR. Again, my sense is that the, in the terms of reference that NALCOR is becoming the kind of the, the whipping post uh, as opposed to understanding and recognizing the, the connection between the executive branch, which in many respects put this agency into play and created the rules and the regulations which create certain forms of, of behavior. So I think we need to talk about and recognize the, you know, that. We need to understand the, the, again, the volatility in terms of the energy markets. We need to understand the impacts of the, or the role on the environment. We, we're not talking about, we're talking about energy restructuring. We have to talk about environmental restructuring um, as well. Um, the other challenge or problem I have is I don't think there was a, a evidence of, of a vision in terms of some kind of framework in terms of how we're going to organize this, this beast. If you have a research project, if it's going to get funded, you have to have some kind of plan. You have to have a set of research questions. You have to have a way of organizing. You have to have partners. You have to, again, talk about the things that, that were talked earlier in terms of making sure that these things are, are put in, into play. So there needs to be, again, this kind of um, you know, vision in terms of how we're going to explore this. Um, there's also you know, very little discussion in terms of um, you know, forms of engagement or well, the policy tools. In policy tools, we have for participation or creating forms in terms of uh, participation. Um, what forms of bringing together experts and community forms of knowledge? Um, 
Barb Neese is here, we worked in Coast Under Stress, talking about how do we bring communities together? How do we not insult communities? How do we engage them? How do we take advantage of their knowledge and, and their experience? How, what forms of expert knowledge? You know, so in a sense, I think there there's needs to be some kind of conversation in terms of how we're going to actually um, you know, put this, uh, this project and, and create the knowledge resources and, and, and the, these linkages. We also need to understand and recognize there needs to be an understanding that there often is bias um, in terms of evidence gathering. So we need to, again, spend a fair bit of time talking about mixed methods and ways in terms of ensuring that there, if there are gender biases or, or rural, uh, urban uh, biases or so on and so forth, that that's kind of part of at least the, the, the general understanding uh, and, and, and recognizing that. We also need to, I think, recognize and understand, as some of you do, that this is a problem that doesn't just exist in Newfoundland and Labrador. Whether you're looking at Site C, whether you're looking at Manitoba, right across the country, we've had this history of this kind of uh, um, executive domination of the executive uh, kind of uh, uh, infrastructure or, 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 or energy production and the management of energy, which again, not surprisingly, because of the province's own uh, the natural resources, including most of the energy resources. So they have, you know, basically their own territorial jurisdictional considerations uh, to be concerned about. So I think um, to have a study of Newfoundland and Labrador only um, is a mistake. We need to understand and recognize that there are certain structural or institutional you know, core problems which, which have to be addressed. So again, in terms of the terms of reference, I didn't see anything um, on that. Um, conclusion. Again, I'm, I'm optimistic in terms of my, my, at least of trying to be as optimistic as, as I can. Um, I think, you know, why we are where we are in part has to do with political decision making and not enough policy informed decision making. And so I, th I think we need to recognize that the part of the challenge in terms of setting this inquiry is that the executive branch has actually decided to set this and put this into play, but also to create the conditions which will facilitate or not facilitate world transformation or change or focusing on the role of the state or the role of citizens uh, or, or even what's happening uh, around us in order to, to ensure. Because if we don't pay attention to what's going on around us, we're not going to be you know, positioned to, to, to do basically anything because we will this kind of the silo based approach we need to, to, to think uh, we have to expand this uh, I think in terms of understand some of the external factors or forces as well um, I think a successful inquiry um, will need an instrument of policy with an eye to building knowledge resources again this, this kind of vision um, you know, back in the days of when Doug Hoax was doing his Royal Commission, there was a lot of discussion in terms of strengths and weaknesses and how to engage. And, and, but basically, thinking critically about how do we do this? How do we carry this out? Let's do it in a way which is good for Newfoundland and Labrador, but doesn't ignore uh, some of the external uh, circumstances or, or, or problems that, that, that we face. Um, but we, we need to, I think, at the very least, identify the critical knowledge gaps the gaps which, we, we, which include environment, which, which include the community, which include shale, which include the U.S. regulations and, and, and so on and so forth, and, and, or even the, in terms of the technical side, in terms of the engineering. We, we haven't done that. So if we're going to actually learn from anything, this can't miss that. We, it's an opportunity. We can't afford um, to, to miss it. We also have to think about how are we going to develop the knowledge resources? How are we going to develop the linkages? How can we do it in a way which, as Sister Elizabeth has says, is, is, con is constructive, is, is, is not competitive? We need to figure out how to bring the different community interests together in a way which is going to produce some, obviously, energy and, and kind of dynamic uh, competition, but do it in a way which is actually going to help to produce a shared perspective, some, some kind of buy-in, some kind of legitimacy, which, again, I think the Muskrat Falls uh, project has, has failed. I see it's zero. Um, I tried to keep it down to, to 10 minutes, um, and I, I appreciate you listening to me. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, now I'm delighted to introduce uh, David Vardy. He's an economist, a former public service uh, public servant, and he served on a number of senior positions, uh, including chair of the Public Utilities Board. David. Good evening, folks. I want to begin by appreciating, expressing my appreciation for you coming out uh, two weeks before Christmas. 
because we chatted about whether we should go ahead and do this now or whether we should wait until after Christmas. And I think it was a good idea to do it now while the iron is hot. And I guess I wanted to begin by saying that uh, I think this, is, this inquiry uh, will mobilize us all over the next two years. It will energize us. It'll be the biggest event in town, but only if we make it so. It depends on us to make it. So it has to, if, if the people are interested in using this as a forum to deal with this issue, then it will happen. If we don't, it won't happen. It doesn't matter what the terms of reference say. So, but I'm not saying the terms of reference are perfect, but I'm saying I'm pumped about the announcement of this uh, inquiry. I think this is a really good thing because it, there has been up to this point in time no forum, no forum. Uh, to talk about these major issues. And these issues are as momentous as the Cod Moratorium of 1992. Indeed, they're as momentous as what happened to us when we lost our sovereignty back in 1934 and we became, uh, uh, we, be we lost our independence. So this is a big issue. So it's good that we can uh, have a focus for this now. This is what we're talking about. This is a picture of the um, It's not a very good picture. It's, uh, it's an unstable picture. I wonder if there's a message. <laughs> Is there a message in all that, right? I didn't, uh, that wasn't deliberate, by the way. But anyway, uh, I want to start off with the delusion and the reality. Now, there's a delusion surrounding this whole project, and it continues to exist. The delusion that is that there's a great bounty of dividends somehow that this project's going to create. Well, it's not there. I have to tell you the reality is that this is uh, going to be a very painful process. Uh, for during the building of the project, the money is coming out, flowing into the economy, 6,000 people being employed. All this money is flowing into this community right now as we speak. Lots of people working and uh, not taking anything out of the economy. But wait until 2020. That's when the pain begins. What we're into is a project with short-term ga uh, gain for long-term pain. It's not a good formula. Our challenge as a community is to forge a consensus as, as to how we're going to take this and turn it around and turn it this into something good, or something as good as it can be, not necessarily the best, but as good as it can be. The inquiry offers hope, but really it requires, number one, that we all mobilize and become interested, but it also requires the terms of reference be expanded. Now, why do we need an inquiry? I'll just run through this very quickly. We have allegations of cost estimates that have been uh, contrived in order to get the project approved. Very strong accusations, uh, very serious accusations. It's a very serious problem that uh, relates to our uh, ethics, the ethics of our, uh, of our system, of our government, of our processes, uh, of our society. There are problems with the, uh, the, with the fact that we didn't consider demand-side management as a better solution, a much more efficient solution, a much less costly solution. Uh, we've got the contrived demand projections. The, the demand projections are complete, were completely out of whack in terms of there was a projection that uh, energy demand was going to increase by an enormous amount. And now the new projections coming out of Nelcor is that there's no increase very modest increase over the next few years, so the demand is not there. Um, we introduced legislation to strengthen the monopoly position of Melcor at a time when the rest of the world was moving away from monopolies. Uh, the, the rest of the world was doing away with monopolies and in, in, in introducing more competition. And then the lack of transparency. Those are good reasons. And the ineffectual water management agreement, which I don't have time to get into. Uh, what the, the, but the big point here is not so much about the sins of the past as it is about the potential for remedy in the future. And the, the remedy, what I see the inquiry doing is presenting options for the future, including during the construction period and during the operation itself. We've got three years to go before this project is finished. There are things we should learn about what the mistakes we've, we've made over the last number of years that we can apply in the future. And that's one of the reasons why I believe there needs to be an interim report. The inquiry needs to be tasked to provide an interim report. What's the purpose? Now, you look at the terms of reference. I have them here. I've studied them again and again and again. I ask and I look there and I see, what's the purpose? Does the, do the terms of reference tell me what this is all about? What's the purpose of this inquiry? They don't tell me that. Uh, I have to look elsewhere to find that. Um, 
certainly the understanding of the past is an important part of all this, but the options for the future, I don't see that there. I look through the terms of reference, I see nothing about the future. Uh, and that's, a, that's really disconcerting. It's really disconcerting. Uh, what I do think is really important is engagement. We've got to engage the citizens. We, people were not engaged in this product, project up to now. We need for them to become engaged. This was imposed. This was a project which was somebody's idea of a solution, a big solution to our economic development problems. And at lesser, to, to a lesser extent, a solution to our energy problems. But this is not developed in a logical, rational, professional way. This was a project that came out of the blue. It didn't come out of any kind of natural processes of governance. And so what we've got to do is got to engage the citizens. And the first thing we have to do is ask the right questions. We have to figure out what the right, the right questions are. And, uh, and that's, one of the, that's the first thing that the commissioner needs to do is to identify what are the questions. What are the questions that need to be asked? And the questions really relate not only to the construction phase, but more importantly is the period after construction. There's a 50-year period when we're going to be paying back the, all the loans that we've incurred. Uh, how are we going to do that? How are we going to operate this uh, project so that it's beneficial? Um, so we need greater clarity. We need more explicit terms of reference. Yes, we need to look at the past, but there has to be a balance between the past and the future. There are huge omissions, huge omissions in these terms of reference. No reference to environment, no reference to health, no reference to safety. The North Spur is a huge threat to safety. The methylmercury issue is a health issue. It's an issue that really didn't get dealt with properly, and now it's being looked at by an independent expert advisory committee, and that was set up in advance, and it was set up in a reactive way because of demonstrations and the occupation of the site that Jim and his colleagues undertook. But th there are big issues there that are not, they're not to be found in there. Now, what, what I'm told is that, well, the commissioner can interpret the, some of these terms and perhaps creatively uh, uh, identify a reason to look at environment, health, and safety. But those all go back to cost issues, they go back to scheduling issues. Those issues deserve to be dealt with on their own merit. And they shouldn't be uh, up to the discretion of the, the commissioner. They deserve to be front and center explicit. They need to be explicit. The relationship with Quebec. Underlying all this is the relationship with Quebec. Because many people put this forward as a, this was going to be the solution to our problems with Quebec, our past problems with Quebec, and why we have the Upper Churchill, the inequity of the Upper Churchill. So that needs to be, that needs to be in there. There needs to be some reference to that. There needs to be reference to the question of are we, what are the transmission options available to us? Uh, if, 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 did we actually have to build a maritime link? Are there other transmission options available to us? Are there other marketing options available to us? We need to look at those agreements with AMERA which uh, we started out with the 2020 principle. Now, we're committing, we're committing most of the expenditures ourselves because the, the AMERA was going to commit 20%, now they're committing 12%. Originally, they were going to get 20% of the energy because it was 20% of the investment to 20% of the energy. Now it's 12% of the investment for more than 50% of the energy. So that's gone awry. But we need to deal with that. That, can't, that shouldn't be silent. We should, the terms of reference shouldn't be silent. The water management agreement. We don't have a water management agreement. You can't operate this project without a water management agreement. The monopoly issues. We can't operate Nelcor as a, a monopoly. That won't work. It's just not feasible to operate uh, Nelcor as a monopoly because you can't force people to consume power. You can say that there's only one provider, but people will look at other forms of energy other than electricity. How should the, um, how should the commissioner conduct his operation. First thing you should do is scope out the questions with public input. He should build a team of independent experts. And I say independent experts, they're going to be hard to find because there are a few independent experts available. Many companies, engineering companies, have done work for an Alcor in the past. So finding independent experts is not going to be easy. Public participation, the public should be involved in framing the questions right from the get-go. If the public are not involved in framing the questions from the get-go, this is going to be a lost cause. There have got to be options for public review. What are the options? How are we going to get out of this dilemma? That's the key issue. What, what options can be put forward by the commission to the government and to the people of the province? 
seek external input. We've got to get ideas from outside. As Steve was saying, it's important that we put this into an international context. We don't operate by ourselves. We operate in a framework uh, which is governed to a large extent when it comes to electricity but by what the Americans are doing and how they govern, how they regulate transmission of energy and how they, how they govern the generation uh, of energy. All these issues need to be dealt with. Uh, we need to build a database. So th these are some of the things that the commissioner needs to do. And, uh, and I think there should be an interim report before this is, I think there should be an interim report because if we have to wait for two years, then we're gonna have to wait too long to get answers that we need. And the project, the uh, commission, should have a major focus on improving Muskrat Falls and in not only the operation, but the construction phase as well. Remember, there's three years left and maybe more because we've already had one uh, major delay in the schedule there are likely to be others as well. So I think we need to inform ourselves as to what mistakes we've made and learn from our mistakes and do things better. But we also have to find out how to get out of the impasse that we have because we have a project on our hands right now that is really not viable. I thank you very much for listening uh, t tonight and I look forward to your questions. Thanks again to all the panelists. Uh, I learned a remarkable amount uh, since thus far. And so um, now we'd like to open up uh, for questions uh, for the panelists. Um, just a quick reminder that uh, to try to keep concise, we have a lot of people in the room. We'd like to hear from as many people as possible. We have uh, one microphone stand over here. We also have a microphone that we can move towards you if you can't get to the uh, microphone stand. And we also have questions coming in by email as well. So we'll be going back and forth uh, between the email questions because this is being, um, uh, it's on the World Wide Web. Uh, and so um, we're going to start with questions now. And again, just raise your hand if um, you'd like us to come to you with a microphone. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Ken Kavanaugh, Bill Island. I wanted to get up first because I need to catch a fever to get back overseas later on tonight. Um, uh, thank you uh, so much to the people who organized this. Thank you to the four speakers. Tremendous job. Uh, thank you to all of you who are here. I'm here because I'm one angry, concerned citizen, and I also wanted to be an example of how we need to have all citizens be engaged and come to these kinds of forums and to get involved in this process. My, my question uh, is going to be about something, I guess, Stephen, that you said this morning. I might have misheard uh, you, and I'm not saying this to be to criticize, it's just a, as a spin-off for my question. I thought I heard you on CBC uh, this morning, and I think you made reference to this not being about blame. Please tell me it ain't so. This inquiry is going to serve a lot of purposes, but quite honestly, and you've referred to it quite eloquently, this whole boondoggle, this whole fiasco, is about poor governance, poor practice of democracy, no openness and transparency. So I want to see some blame. So I'd like to hear your response and the other panelists. I'm hoping that this inquiry will put out for public view, and I'm going to leave Nalcor aside. I'm referring to uh, the former administration, one main premier, ex-premier Danny Williams, and three other subordinate premiers after him, foisted this on us. So I want to see some blame, and let's, I'll take the word blame out and call it accountability. I am hoping that you will tell me that after this inquiry is over, even though the commissioner may not say guilty as charged, but will make it very clear to all of us who is at fault here. Because I can't take another 30 seconds of Danny Williams telling me that this is our heritage fund. You, you heard me this morning, I think, talking about the inquiry. As you know, I've been very aggressive. 
uh, and so I've, I've been, you know, very much in the, the media and tweeting the rest of it. So I've been, I've been fairly aggressive. I was talking about the inquiry and, and again, in terms of setting this, uh, the personalities going forward really don't matter. I mean, the matter in terms of obviously in politics, it's uh, to gain credit and, and to avoid blame or, or make, blame somebody else. Uh, so for our purposes here, we were talking about the role of an inquiry in order to, the people don't matter. What matters is, are the outcomes. What matters is the engagement and the different interests involved within engagement. So we can spend a lot of time and energy just talking about blaming people, but it doesn't take us any further in terms of understanding what's happening with shale, who's driving shale, uh, what, is, what are the impacts in terms of, you know, the changes in terms of the energy markets within the United States, or regulation or deregulation, what, how does that matter? Today we had a, a minister from Quebec who, who came and was talking to our department, and even they know and understand that there are significant changes and challenges in the Northeast accessing it through infrastructure, changes in terms of energy. And so in a sense, you know, we can sit around with Quebec, and, as, as you suggested before, and there's a lot of reason, perhaps, to, to blame people. But it doesn't do anything in terms of recognizing and understanding the you know, tremendous changes which are occurring within the United States. And the, the reality is that, that we are interdependent. In terms of, I think, in terms of how we should actually be framing issues, it shouldn't be based on politics. It should be based on what do what's, what makes the best uh, what, what is the best way of, of dealing with energy for citizens or, or climate as opposed to for Quebec or for or for politicians because they don't. And, and, and at the end of the day, what matters to the to the individual citizen is how much they're paying or what matters to the climate. So we need to, I think, to a certain extent, figure out how to remove the politics because the politics has actually prevented us from actually talking about, thinking about, um, engaging. And the politics, in many, many of these decisions have been based on politics. And so in a sense that the blame game, which you can sometimes see the, the removal or, or the taking, you know, and changes in terms of some new villain. Um, you know, in the past, I, I remember once I was saying about Danny uh, Williams being a, a, a popular villain. <laughs> but it doesn't, it doesn't get us any further if we just continue to focus all of our negative energy on blame. And, and we need to understand and recognize there is obviously a role for understanding and recognizing who did, who did what. Um, but I think we need to, in order to build a community, move beyond the personalities. Because at the end of the day, what Wacky Bennett did in terms of infrastructure and, and you know, Muskrat or uh, uh, the Two Rivers policy now site C, which is inherited, which is embedded, we, don't, we need to understand that path dependency. But, but I think in order to actually to repair it, to improve it, to, to prevent it from occurring in the past. We can't forget the past, but the blame side of it won't really solve anything. And we need to okay. understand, recognize Thanks, that Stephen. in an inquiry. Thanks, Stephen. David, did you have anything to say? Yeah, I think it's very important for us to understand what happened, exactly what happens. We, knew, we need to do the forensic analysis. We do need to do the forensic analysis. We've got to go back and find out exactly what happened. Where did this uh, uh, fall off the, right, with the rails? We've got to figure out what the decision-making process was, because we've got to be able to find out a way to correct it. We have to, because if we, if we can't, we will continue to repeat those mistakes. And so a large part of this, ex this whole, uh, ex this commission, this inquiry, is to look at how democracy has ma malfunctioned in Newfoundland and Labrador. So that's, I think, a really important part of this whole thing. You've got to look back. You've got to look back, but then you've got to figure out what you have to do to correct that. And that's one of the things that, uh, that I didn't get to mention, is that the dem I, I'm looking for the commissioner to report on democracy. What needs to be done to improve our democracy? Because we have a failure uh, in democracy. For me, that's the biggest issue of all, the failure of our democracy. So yes, we do need to go back and find out uh, what went wrong. But the biggest issue at the end of the day, the, uh, the output from this Royal Commission has to be uh, to look at what are the options available to us, the best options, including some that are not very palatable, one of which would, may be the mothballing of the plant. I mean, after we finished, after fi finishing building, got to look at all the options and, uh, and see what is the best way out. And I think that's what we want from the Commission. Thanks, David. Um, <laughs> Sister Elizabeth, you were talking about the future and future generations. Any thoughts on accountability? Yeah, I fully understand where your question is coming from. But this, we have two years. We don't have 10 years. We don't have 15 years. I was on a 13-month commission. 
and I know how tight that was, and it wasn't even a controversial issue. My biggest concern is we protect the North Spurs so we don't drown all the people on the river, and we need to, and we need to make sure that that methyl mercury doesn't po poison everybody on the river. If you read the information sheets from now, the NALCOR team, they say that they will carefully monitor the amount of mercury to make sure it matches the Health Canada guidelines. It, like that, that I almost, I, c I couldn't believe what I was reading about an issue about poisoning water and mm. wildlife and people and talking about meeting Health Canada guidelines in the same sentence. So my biggest fear is we could rouse up incredible energy in this province around whose fault it is. But in two years, you don't have the time or the luxury. We have months to solve those two issues because we have to stop that before the methyl mercury goes into the water and we have to stop it before the spur starts to melt in front of our eyes. And I'm not an engineer. But I can read, and I read reputable scientific work. So that's my biggest fear, Ken. We Newfoundlanders sometimes get into the trap of getting so energetically mad at people that we forget that there are good things we need to do here. That one person, one commissioner, has to get every group represented in this room together, all different viewpoints, working towards the future of this province in a way we've never done before because our democracy is failing. And so we don't have a lot of time. That's my, the historical record for me is less important except what does it teach us going forward. But there are urgent issues, not urgent, emergent, emergency issues here that we don't have the luxury of time. My thing is the commissioner has to take three months to write the questions. I was in healthcare too long to know that the medical researchers told us the questions and thought we were interested in the answers. It took me my whole health career to get the researchers to know, we will tell you the questions, you find the answers. And I don't think that that justice, any more than it was me who had been appointed, knows how to even frame the questions. So he has to talk to the Ken Kavanaugh's and the, the people, Elizabeth Davis, is to say, what are the questions I need to be asking? That's going to take him three months of wasted time. Then he has to stop the North Spur, and then he has to stop the methyl mercury. He doesn't have time at that stage. He can do another inquiry later about whose fault it is. Thank you. We're going to Jim, and then back out to the audience. Jim. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, for us, of course, downstream is very much the contradiction of Canada talking about safe food. And we looking at our province, or this province, that island, poisoning the very food a lot of us depend on, from the smelts to the seals, from uh, Mud Lake to Rigolet. It, it is a small population. It isn't fair. So somebody, yes, somebody has to be blamed. I agree, agree with that. But uh, the sister's point is well taken, that uh, if, if there is even a long time in the news, let's get on with uh, getting people involved. My goodness, as soon as we get the people involved, it, this is a done deal. The answers will come faster than you can imagine, but creating awareness to a population that just seems to sit around and not be all that aware and wait for the politicians to tell them what the next job they're going to get, that's, that's not really a, a, dem a democracy that I want to live in much longer, because I won't, but uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Uh, <clears throat> some of my uh, question has been answered already. Uh, I'm really concerned about uh, the question of citizen engagement. When you ask a question, does anybody listen? And uh, does anybody uh, uh, react t to the questions? Now, I've posed a number of these questions in, in the newspaper. And first of all, nobody seems to read the newspaper anymore, which is <laughs> somewhat unfortunate. And um, I get very little feedback, even from my friends and neighbors. So that's p 
part of the story, but uh, some of the questions have been fairly explicit. I uh, asked when uh, Gilbert Bennett talked about the, the Norse Spur, uh, I was quite alarmed the way he described the problem because I'm well aware of the behavior of sensitive clays. I recall the San Vianney disaster in Quebec, and it didn't seem in the report in the newspaper to really uh, appreciate the, the potential problems. My question that I posed in the letter was, was first of all a recommendation that you get the best experts in the world to investigate the problem and you reply back to the people. I uh, was hoping at least uh, a response uh, explaining what was done, what was found, what is recommended, who was chosen to look at these issues. Uh, hopefully in the paper, better still on the television, where the experts could have been questioned uh, but I'm still waiting. Now this has gone on two or three years, mm -hmm. which uh, leaves one feeling rather uncomfortable about the North Spur. Now I should just mention I'm a hydro engineer. I've spent most of my career in the business. I've worked on several projects in Newfoundland. I've worked in other parts of the world. I've tried to keep abreast of of uh, some of the issues. Uh, I, I have a, a f interesting file, it's not as thick as it could have been because I gave away some of the material concerning the matter of uh, methyl mercury. So, uh, so we have a question about citizen engagement. Um, that's basically and, and what the, it is. And the North Spur and the engagement of yeah. experts. Yeah, well okay. I guess to just to wrap up, I'd like the, the Commission to answer one of those questions. Yeah. that I've posed and others have posed and now of course doing their best to document but uh, uh, pr probably just as important uh, we need to improve our democracy uh, or get our system going better that those who, who, who have knowledge to share uh, talk about it uh, get up in the public forum write letters to the editor whatever you're supposed to do okay so um, again, another uh, question about sort of democracy and perhaps a democracy, democratic deficit, but also public engagement uh, and ex perhaps expanding, um, asking the questions that Sister Elizabeth was talking about around the inquiry. When I was working with one more commission, I did a study on citizen engagement. And I started off with what citizen engagement? So within the piece that I produced, I talked about the lack of citizen engagement, talked about the mechanisms and processes which are you know, relied upon. Uh, Catherine Furback at uh, the University of Dalhousie produced a book basically in terms of how the healthcare system could and should engage citizens and provided citizens with that kind of information. The other thing when I was going through that citizen engagement piece, I was looking at the biomedical system, the disease-based uh, approach in terms of how we look at issues and problems, and about 97% of the research is constructed based on that framework. So they have a, a monopoly. So experts tend to often go where the money is or where the networks exist. So if we're going to have transformation or change, we need to understand and recognize the limitations or where citizen engagement occurs. How can we improve it in terms of in close under stress? We try to bring together citizen forms of knowledge and bring that with expert forms of knowledge. We need that, that kind of conversation. Th this kind of conversation could take place within, within this inquiry. But we also need to understand what, what are the biases in terms of where the knowledge is constructed, how the knowledge is constructed. Or if you wanted to construct a knowledge in terms of improving the outcomes for citizens, um, what kind of systems would be necessary, what kind of data sharing, what kind of evidence gathering would be significant in terms of identifying or dealing with the issues which really matter as citizens. Okay, I'm going to go to Jim. Any thoughts about this? I'm sorry, I need to, to, could you repeat the question for me please? Sure, it's a question about citizen engagement in the uh, um, expertise and to a certain degree um, the democratic deficit. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, 
as far as citizens being involved, as citizens' awareness, that I think uh, is key because if citizens were aware and engaged and involved, this situation would not have gotten as far out of hand as it has. So, in, in different difference of time, and my knowledge of this, being able to expand on that, I'm not uh, say that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. David or Elizabeth. Sister Elizabeth. I think there are two other points I would add to what has been said. One is the world has changed since the Romano Commission. Mm -hmm. In the Romano Commission, we were still reading newspapers. We were still even watching television. Social media today is a to wasn't existing then. And if the ju justice, does, the commissioner does not use social media, he's not going to be able to engage citizens. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm a nerd. Uh, I don't have, I'm not on Facebook, and I don't tweet. So I'm like a dinosaur. There's only a few of me left on the planet, so I should be protected. <laughs> <laughs> but any inquiry today that's not totally embedded in social media is a waste of time, to put it in the same sentence with citizen engagement. The second shift that's happened since Steve and I had engagement with the Roman Oak Commission is who is an expert. We thought then experts meant university professors and doctors and maybe stretching it to nurses. Today we know expert means something totally different. We need experts in finances and construction and whatever the third one is, is name, energy, that's named in, 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 actually named in inquiry. But the first group we have to get into here are the environmentalists and the social scientists. But who are the real experts? The people who are going to be eating that fish? The people are going to be drinking that water. The people are going to be paying double their electricity rates. And the people are not going to get help in the hospital because we can't afford to keep the hospital going because we're paying off the debt that we have. They're the real experts. The ordinary people who at the end of the day will be the ones who suffer here. I'm going to come at this in a slightly different way in responding to Phil Hellwig's question. Uh, in, and I want to pose it in the context of the North Spur, which is, which is the context of his question. Uh, the problem with the North Spur is that there's no uh, way to seek redress. For a group affected by it, there's no, at present, there has been no way to seek redress. Same with the methylmercury. Uh, under the recommendations of the joint panel, there was a process that was put in place uh, that was recommended. And that process involved an independent a dispute resolution committee, which was supposed to be independent of NALCOR. Well, they have established an, a dispute resolution committee. It's chaired by NALCOR, so it doesn't work. There's no, what's needed is some kind of an ombudsman for when there's an issue like the North Spur and there are a group of people uh, who want to get to bring that issue forward, then there should be some kind of process, a governance process, which uh, enables those people to uh, bring forward and have a serious consideration of the issue. That's not happening right now. There's been no, consider no serious consideration of the North Spur uh, because uh, the uh, engineering consultants and NELCOR basically said, we're satisfied. We don't really want to listen to anybody, any more complaints. Would you please go away? That's part, part number one of my response. The second part of my response is that what you, what, what's needed for the North Spur is a, an independent panel of technical experts. Who are, who are people who have uh, the expertise and knowledge to look at this, that's not this commission here right now, this in the commission of inquiry. But there is a role for the commission of inquiry. The commission of inquiry be is the, or can become a, 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 re a redress. It can become a court. It can become somewhere where people can go to say there is a problem. And so I th what I see is I see the, the uh, inquiry providing an ombudsman role in, this, in, in dealing with this problem. And then what I would see is the inquiry would recommend next steps, what needs to happen to ensure that the North Spur is perfectly safe. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. There, uh, my name is Dev Sullivan, and uh, I write the Uncle Arley blog with, along with great contributions from people like Dave Erty and Kevin Martin and others uh, who may not be here, and we write frequently on Muskrat Falls. I, there was a, a couple of comments I would like to make because 
while I appreciate uh, the, the comments of each of the panelists, I have this sense that you haven't perhaps thought through <coughs> what public expectations will be in three years' time. You have to remember, I suggest, that at that time, we are talking in the context of 17 cent power and a contribution from government in one form or another of four to five hundred million dollars, depending on whose numbers you believe. And you have to remember in that context that by the time the election rolls around and we're into the next term, the huge deficit of at least one and a half billion dollars will have to be dealt with. So you have to think in terms of a population who are probably going to be faced not just with a doubling of power rates, you're going to be, they are going to be faced with a severe curtailment of services. And you know, that discussion has been very substantially been avoided, deliberately so, by almost all commentators over the last few years. We have not. I have failed as much perhaps as anyone else to be able to put in real terms the, 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 the real pain, the real hurt, the real deprivation that is associated with cutting a couple of billion dollars out of government expenditures and giving people 17 cent power just as a bonus. There's two other things I, I would like to point out. Part of the necessity of this commission and the, and it, and the results of what it writes is that there has to be a healing process. And I think that at the end of the day, given the, the, the severity and size of what has transpired here in the context of a $13.7 billion project, I think that people will not heal, will not come to grips with institutional issues, political issues, and there are others that, that you have outlined, will not come to grips with any of those issues unless they feel justice has been done. And we're not talking here, and I won't take much more of your time, but we're not talking here about an accident. We're talking about a political decision. A, a political decision that ignored basic institutions of review. We're also talking about decisions that fundamentally shut people out from having a say in this thing. And I suggest we are talking about, as Dave Vardy specifically mentioned, issues of falsification. And I'd like to think that the anonymous engineer who I quoted on this blog back in the, at the end of January has had some effect on causing this outcome of holding a judicial inquiry. And I would like to read four sentences, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. This engineer said, quote, I could not put up with falsifying information anymore. To begin with, the original cost of $6.2 billion on which the project was approved was a complete falsification. The estimate was deliberately kept low, below $7 billion, so as to appear favorable relative to the cost of thermal power. And he just adds, the likely costs were known about three years ago, but the Alcor management kept it a secret, steadfastly denying that there were major scheduled delays and cost overruns until it was no longer possible to hide the true status with the election of a new government. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is an engineer who spent several years on the inside at Nalcor. He was not performing this service gratuitously. Okay, so we have... Uh, uh, and I, 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 Madam okay. Chairman, I think I would like to ask 
the panel then, how would they feel that the terms of reference might be changed to accommodate a more explicit inquiry or at least some guidance to the commissioner with regard to looking out for matters of falsification, for possible malfeasance. Okay. So there's a, um, if that's the question, we will focus on falsification then. <laughs> when I talked earlier about the Royal Commissions, Royal Commissions sometimes appear when there is crises. So we had the, you know, the Royal Sirwa Commission study, which was a period of crises, crises comparable to, to what you've described. Um, we've had the McDonald Commission in many respects, in part because of the collapse of the, the last national policy, which again was this kind of sense of crisis or transformation. We had the Roman Royal Commission in part because there was this kind of sense of the spiraling costs, outcomes not, not being met, yet there wasn't kind of a sense of crisis and the status quo survived. So I think with this inquiry, which I think we're closer to crises and transfer, the need for the kinds of transformation which I think you're, you're talking about, my challenge or problem is that the, in terms of the terms of union, it may actually be a, an, an, a, you know, an, an attempt to defend the status quo. And if that is the case, and if, the, and if, if we are in a, a period of crises and policy failure, the status quo was probably not going to be sufficient. So we need to have that kind of conversation in terms of the inquiry. If this is really a, the kind of a, a huge crises and political uh, problem and, and, and the result of policy failure and so on and so forth, if we don't revisit the role of the state, if we don't revisit some of the, the crucial, crucial critical mechanisms and, and, and find ways in order to, to get around this, identify this, but again, it's very much, I think, a, a question is can the status quo survive? Okay. And Thanks. my challenge yeah. is, again, in terms of the terms of reference, is that it may be more about the status quo as opposed to transformation or change. Okay. Any other comments about falsification? No falsification, but there's maybe we're not listening to my first presentation. One of my three big issues is the social consequences and the failure of government to the appearance of the ordinary citizen to be addressing that issue. And I think I named the four first groups that are going to be affected older people, sick people, poor people, and children. So I was quite explicit in saying that I do think if this commission is going to mean anything, it has to address that. But I also want to speak to the healing piece. We have terribly sad examples around this world where there have been large ruptures in society. South Africa would be an example. Uh, Eastern Europe would be an example. And what we have learned from those major healing processes is that f focusing on the blame game, finding out who was wrong, goes nowhere. Each of those healing processes has found ways to bring disparate groups together to find a new way forward. Bishop Tesman Tutu from South Africa has been a primary champion in that, but not the only one. And I would say that some of the expertise we probably, the commissioner probably needs to bring in are people who've lived through those healing experiences and did it without fa finding fault as the primary purpose. It's finding a way together into good that has proven to be much more effective in those very real cases. Dave? Thanks, Dave, for your question. I, um, I think there's fundamental changes in the terms of reference needed because the way these terms of reference are written, they're intended to place the blame on NELCOR and ignoring the relationship between NELCOR and the government and the fact that government actually created NELCOR. The government created this process. Government and uh, so the terms of reference really shift the focus on the sins of NELCOR. Now, many of us see a multitude of sins within NELCOR. But we have to realize that the ultimate perpetrator are the people who wrote the Energy Corporation Act and put that, that corporation in place. And, uh, as, and, and that's, I think, the real problem here. So the, the tone, the to the, there's a need for major changes in the tone. The tone of these uh, is incredibly, um, incredibly uh, uh, it's basically trying to shift the blame to some other group. I have to say, the part of this this inquiry is to look at, as I said earlier, into the, the governance system that we have in place and the role of democracy in our institutions, but certainly 
the people at Nalcor are public servants, okay? We have to realize, quite often we tend to think that the, the public servants are the people that live in the Confederation Building, and the people that live over at Eastern Health and Nalcor are not public servants, but they are public servants, okay? And the question is, what, what, we're, what code of conduct are they, are they living under? I think we have to look at the, the code of conduct by which the public service is governed. And, uh, and I think that's a fundamental issue. But I think the tone of these, uh, these terms of reference is, is very clear that the people who wrote these terms of reference are the people who were the, involved with the commissioning of this project in the first instance and who continue to be involved. And, and you see that written all over. You see it in the terms of reference of the Ernst & Young report, where the terms of reference were focused on the wrong issues. Here again, that we're, we're shifting the focus away from government, we're shifting it to a Crown Corporation. The Crown Corporation is not the problem. Okay, thanks. Um, Jim, any, Jim, any comments? Yes, a short one. Uh, and all of this, I, I can't help but think we keep missing the people who can make the difference, and that is, that be the people themselves. When are we going to wake up and be more aware that we can't let these civil servants, we can't let these experts, we can't let the, these uh, politicians just keep doing these things to us? How many failures have we had uh, in government because people are not paying attention? I think everybody kind of wants to say this, but nobody's actually saying it. Bad voters, bad government. So let's, let's just try and go back to uh, Sister Elizabeth Franklin. Thank you. Just a little bit point on getting people involved because that is where the change will happen. The change will not happen at the top. The top will resist. The change has to come from the bottom, the common people. And until the common people stand up, nothing will change. We can holler as long as we, as loud as we want. It will not change. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Back to the back to the microphone here. Yes. Uh, did you have someone online or on the phone or? Me first? Okay. Uh, for all those who know me, I'm Angus Anderson from Nain Labrador, New Nut Seattle. I've been standing and supporting the Labrador land protectors and the Grand River Keepers now for six years, and I do it proudly. Being from Nain, I have seen what a dam can do. Forty years ago, there was a dam built 35, 40 feet away from my house. And it was made as a water reservoir. It's like a miniature version to me of Muskrat Falls. And I have seen in 40 years what that little dam had done to the downstream, upstream, and the plants in that little dam in Maine. I've seen the plants change color. I've seen the fish they're slimy now, they're, you can't eat them, you fry them, they turn gray. The ducks don't land there anymore like they used to. The dam had busted once before and nearly killed someone. I mean, that's a miniature version of, to me, Muskrat Falls. If you can get people to that dam in Maine, or to the dam in McCovic, or Rigolet, test the basement of the dam, you will find slime, which is methylmercury. Such a simple thing. Go up there, get the sample, catch a fish, like use those real life samples, because I've seen it myself. I used to catch those little fish, now I can't because they're poisonous. Another effect that everybody is missing about, about the dam, Muskrat Palace Dam, is, uh, I know, North Spur is dangerous, yes. The methylmercury is dangerous, yes. But look at the, the land, miles and miles and miles of sand bank, like on both sides. All that sand has got to go somewhere when the water is pressing on it. It's going to go downstream. It's going to go past the waterfall. You see now already affecting downstream, like people in Mud Lake saying that now there's more sand dunes and less streams. We need people to look at those issues that everyone seems to be missing because if the inquirer does not focus into that, like in time the generators at Muskrat Piles will be clogged up in the sand. So 
I ask that the inquiry or people making suggestions and recommendations to the inquiry go to me, send scientists up. It's right there. Proof is right there what a dam can do. Thank you. Thank you. As I mentioned before, in the United States, a lot of the states don't consider hydro as, as green. I mean, part of it is, is a political fight. But the challenger problem is that people aren't going to these areas. I mean, historically, they just, it's for an urban kind of uh, you know, community. And they, they ignore it. They, I mean, in, in Quebec, uh, before the Cree went down and put their canoes into the water in New York Harbor, Nobody recognized and understood that problem. That problem has existed for a long period of time, but the politics has prevented us from actually focusing on that. And we need to focus on that. That's an outcome. If that's an outcome, we need to understand who are the winners, who are the losers. We need to be honest about that. And then, of course, we have to you know, acknowledge that, recognize that, and deal with that in, based on evidence and based on the communities themselves. Thanks, Stephen. There's another question embedded in your question that I had when Dave asked me to come on this panel. Mm -hmm. Who is going to listen to us? Like, how do I know that the commissioner will hear anything the four of us have said and anything you have said in the audience? So your question about how do we influence, uh, how can we influence the terms of reference, it's not clear to me. The commissioner is not here. I wouldn't expect him to be here. Maybe there is somebody here taking notes from him. Nobody has asked me for my notes to give to him. So I don't know how we get the commissioner to hear our concerns so that the commissioner at least can broadly, interpretation is my one skill, that how the commissioner could even interpret the present terms as broadly as he wants but I'm not sure he's going to even hear what we said. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a huge issue here. Yeah, really a huge yeah. issue. Jim, any thoughts? Go ahead, Jim. Uh, hello. I'm sorry, we're just having trouble connecting and disconnecting now. Mm -hmm. I just want to go back to what uh, Angus Anderson said uh, about the North America effect. Uh, the that little dam in Maine is a prime example of what the whole of uh, the Mishkabal Reservoir, known now as the J.R. Smallwood Reservoir, uh, is and has affected the uh, whitefish populations up there. That that they tried to make that an industry, they couldn't because of the mass mercury poisoning. So, uh, thank you. I will stop there. There's a lot more to be said about that, but thank you. Okay, David. I did, I did want to make a comment. Yeah, I did want to make a comment. Um, I guess first, the first comment I want to make is that some of us had suggested there should be a public consultation process before the government announced the terms of reference. And I think that way people would have had an opportunity to talk about this before the terms of reference were written. Hopefully they're not carved in stone. And perhaps from this process tonight, there will be enough uh, public um, outcry that, uh, we, that something will happen. The government will see the need to go back and reframe the terms of reference. Uh, but perhaps uh, the people that are the organizing group and the panel might uh, want to do a post-mortem after the night and uh, figure out whether there might be some way we can, as, as Elizabeth suggested, uh, make contact with the commission. Great, thanks David. Um, Robin has some questions uh, from, from e that have been emailed in. Yeah, uh, these, there's two questions that, are, uh, that fit quite well with each other and are a nice segue from both some of the questions we've just had and some of the comments from the panel. So I'm just going to read both of them and then ask you all to respond. So the first one is uh, from Patricia Dold who asks, how have the decision makers responded to engagement by citizens with expertise? What can expert citizens do when decision makers do not listen? I thought that Philip's question was along these lines. Dave Vardy sort of addressed this. <laughs> Still, Philip's um, experience points to why citizens do not engage. And the other question is, um, in some ways, I think even um, more to the point. This is from Josh Leposky. What kind of citizen organizing can be done that isn't already being done to push the commission to get Muskrat right? 
So two questions about citizen engagement. I, I think there's uh, a challenge in part, as David has suggested, quite often the terms and the references and the problems and so, so forth are basically just pushed on the agenda and we all kind of respond to it. So we need to think critically about how can we shape or influence the system in order to ensure that citizens are not just spectators and kind of moved around as resources or divided or, or, or not divided based on, again, on, on, the, on the kind of the executive branch. So we need to, if we actually want to engage, we need to understand some of the constraints which are preventing that form, these forms of engagement at all levels of decision making, not only in terms of agenda setting, but also, you know, implementation as well as evaluation. Um, so it, I think within our system there are a number of constraints, but we need to have that real honest conversation. And citizens shouldn't be just responding to what others are saying, that we should actually be engaged uh, directly in terms of making sure that our problems, our issues are being defined and also being resolved. And we need to play a role. And, and, we, and that's why I think there needs to be a lot of restructuring, a lot of rethinking taking place within this Royal Commission. Some of us have tried to reach out to government. Uh, my colleague, Mr. Penny, and I have written to the Premier and uh, asked if we could meet and discuss a number of these issues. Uh, that meeting never happened. It was disappointing. So the uh, recourse that we had was to go to the media, to go to Uncle Narley, to write uh, articles, to try to get the issues out into the public domain. And I think that that's, a, there's a, that's, a, uh, that's been successful to a certain extent. But uh, the thing that I want to re remark upon is the fact that um, so many people are reluctant to speak out in this community. Why is there such a fear factor? I think we've got to deal with this issue that uh, on Uncle Narley's blog, many people in this room I know uh, go to Uncle Narley's blog and make comments, but m most of them are making those comments anonymously. So you have to ask the great question, why are they doing that? What are they afraid of? So uh, you can't have a democracy if people are not prepared to speak up. So, uh, we, and I think the commissioner's got to deal with that issue. I think the commissioner has to speak to the issue of why is it that Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are scared, they're silent, there's silence. There's a silence in our community that is deafening. It's really a big problem. And there's a lot of people I mean, I have to say this, I have a lot of friends at a, po at a point in time, it's, uh, not so much recently, but uh, I, was, I was basically avoided, like a pariah. I was a pariah because I was out speaking out against what the government was doing. And uh, so, and people, a lot of people said, we don't want to put ourselves in that position. We don't want to be pariahs. We don't want to put a big X on our back, okay? Like Dave Verdi has done. But I think that the, uh, we got to find a way. Why are people so scared? We have to find a way to get around that and provide some immunity. And uh, it goes back to our political system, how the political system works and how people, uh, the decision, the discretion that politicians have to uh, make decisions that affer affect people adversely. Uh, big question, big qu I won't try to touch it tonight, it's too complicated. I think there is another element too that's also quite tragic. And that is the separation between the island and the land of Labrador. I do think that people on the La in Labrador have been engaged and have been working very hard around this issue. But the people on the island are more distant from the reality they think. Mm -hmm. And I am, sh uh, and this back to uh, transparency. If people understood in five years' time what they will be paying for electricity, how there will be cuts to the health system, the education system, groups like the Gathering Place and Stella Burries and the Choices for Youth. If people knew that was going to happen in five years' time, I think we'd have more engaged people on the island joining the people already engaged who are direct, most immediately affected. I'd, that's a leadership question. I'd have to be one of the ones who says that I have not been as strong an advocate, but I have to be uh, very careful where I speak. I, you know, if you read Uncle Narley's comment yesterday, there was some question that I should even be on the panel, because what would a nun know about these things? So I have, and I'm a leader of that congregation, so I have to be very careful that I don't cause a lot of backlash to our congregation mm -hmm. when we're trying our best to keep the gathering place afloat, keep our Mercy Center for Ecology and Justice afloat to support St. Patrick's Mercy Home. 
So this gets quite complex when we sometimes, as citizens, don't respect each other's right to have voice. So it's not simple, but I think the island versus the Labrador land is, a, is part of the issue. And we do need stronger leaders speaking out, like the Dave Vardys are speaking out. Um, I, I don't know how to do it, and I, I have too thin a skin sometimes, maybe. I, I think you've shown us how to do it tonight. Uh, Jim, any thoughts? Most definitely. This one is really close to me because uh, Dave that, uh, speaks of a culture of fear and lying when nobody speaks up because they might not get a job or the kids might get a job. That's horrendous. I remember being a kid growing up here in Goose Bay, a lot of families who came ashore had to go to work, and uh, I could not understand why they wouldn't challenge certain aspects of authority, especially on a job where, where uh, it was only fair to do so. And I think I'm seeing it now in spades. So uh, Dave is right, though. We need to uh, get a forum like this to move, move it along. And for heaven's sake, let's, let's pull away from that cultural fear. As for Labrador not speaking up, we're quite used to being buried uh, by a larger portion of our population. I mean, we can vote for whoever, we could vote for JC himself. And if the Lutheran people didn't do it, we would not get JC as a representative because there's just too much of an imbalance. We're a very small population, we have vir virtually no defense, so if we don't speak up a lot, that's probably that probably one of the good reasons as far as I'm concerned, but we all have to overcome that. And I would encourage anybody, for goodness sake, start raising these governments. Let's get involved. Let's kick them around. Let's make them responsible for not having the vision to see things like this and head them off. It's, it's time for this foolishness to stop. Fear will only get more fear. We need to turn up the courage a notch and go for the gusto on fixing this. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, because we're, the clock is starting to wind down, I'm going to ask all three of the folks in line here to ask the questions, and we'll go back to the panel. Go ahead. Largely, my question has been answered. It's really about the status quo, as Dr. Tom was talking about, how do we get away from the status quo. But I just want to say one thing. Um, I worked in the energy industry for 20 years. I wasn't a vice president, I wasn't a president, I was middle management. And all of that knowledge gap type of information, like you say, the not understanding the shale oil industry or how energy demand is changing or the pricing structures in energy, how they may be changing. Well, I was fully aware of that 10 years ago at middle management level. Mm -hmm. So if there was a knowledge gap, it was deliberate because that information was really well known and you know right down through energy industries so i and so my question really is like how do we get at that institutional or structural problem that we have that you know played itself out in the Muskrat Falls issues how do we get at that through this terms of to, through this inquiry and through the terms of reference because there's a structural and institutional problem that has led us down this road so though, if you can answer that or address it or consider it, but I think we need to get that you know, shaped into the uh, inquiry. Okay, thanks. The next question, please. I just wanted to bring up a point about the idea of the culture of fear and letting go of this fear of speaking out and getting involved. And I'm wondering how you folks think that um, that goal um, can be reconciled with a legal system that like very much still reinforces that fear and that has punished the Labrador land protectors for becoming civically engaged and for trying to exert some positive influence over this project. Thank you. I'm, my name is Lisa Moore. I was uh, lucky enough this summer to be in a van crossing Newfoundland from, I mean, crossing Canada from Whistler to BC with Ronald Wright, who is a world-renowned historian. And I asked him if he knew about Muskrat Falls. He's written about hydroelectric dams from all over the world, India, British Columbia. Um, you know, he named off many, many dams and said that they are an antiquated technology. They do not work. They are not green. They cost a fortune, but what really costs a fortune 
is taking them apart and cleaning up the methylmercury that comes after them. And if we look at grassy narrows, we can see what that cost was. Of course, we are living in a moment of truth and reconciliation. And, um, and we know that Starin Marshall, uh, you know, headed the uh, hydroelectric dam in Belize, which silenced the indigenous people there and drove the cost of electricity so high that the people of Belize could no longer afford it. So my question is, is there anyone who, on this commission, who will pose the question, can we walk away from this dam? Thank you. Thanks so much. So I'd like I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to the panel. If we have time, we'll come back to you. Okay. Thanks for your patience. Um, I'm going to go in the other. Um, we're going to start with Jim. Uh, uh, can we walk away from it? I tell you what. Every time I hear this thing, we have to finish this. All I can see in my mind is we have to finish poisoning those people. We have to finish drowning those people. We have to finish ignoring those people. That's what I hear when I hear uh, people say we have to finish this. It becomes so important. Why is it? To me, uh, Muscat Falls is, is a giant wedge driven between Newfoundland and Labrador. Because, as uh, somebody mentioned, uh, the people around, it's, it's not in their backyard, so they're not quite as tuned into as they should be. But, excuse me, it will be in your backyard, in your front yard, and in your mailbox when you deliver the price of your monthly electricity when this thing comes on stream, if it ever does. So for me, it's like, let's find a way to stop it. Let's stop the defeat of, uh, we will have to finish. Why would you have to finish a failure? Why? That's my question. Why finish a failure? Just because we want to keep the Newfoundland government records of failures intact? That's all I can see about this. So thank you. Thanks, Jim. I'd like to go to Sister Elizabeth next. Um, oh, I, I won't speak to the last question, but the first two questions around how do you change a society that has gone in probably the wrong direction around the invoice of the people and true democracy. The only way it's changed in the past is if enough people are convinced that it was the wrong direction and we're willing to come together to make a difference. And what I have learned as I've gotten older is that the more diverse the groups who come together, the higher the probability is that you will get the goal that you want, that you need. And it won't necessarily be the one that I thought we would get. So again, I come back to my premise here that this inquiry will only work if there are diverse voices that are not only heard, that's only half of it. The other half is they exchange with each other. So a true network or a community is created and only out of that will we be able to defeat the, not only the, the da dangers of the Muskrat Falls, but the fact the direction we're going in in democracy, which is not unique to Newfoundland and Labrador. But we're small enough and, and close enough that we can break this, but it will require leadership. and, and um, I'm convinced that it can happen. I mean, I'm not here on this panel because I'm convinced it can happen. But we have to have little fires here and there to make it ignite if it's going to happen. But bringing diverse groups, I listed a number of them together, having them exchange with each other in a way that creates a third way that nobody talk about, thought about, I think is the only way forward. Is the commissioner brave enough to do that? I have no doubt he's smart enough. Is he brave enough to do that? I hope he is. Uh, comment on a couple of things here now. And um, uh, the problem we're in here in Newfoundland Labrador is similar to what, what's happening in other places, as Steve mentioned, in terms of Manitoba and British Columbia. Big difference is that Muskrat Falls is so big in relationship to the small province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, in British Columbia, Site C uh, represents 3.5% of the gross domestic product of British Columbia. In Newfoundland and Labrador, Muskrat Falls represents close to 50% of our gross domestic product. So if it fails, it's going to take the province down with it. 
Site C is not going to take BC down. The, the major projects, uh, Kiask, Kanawapa, and Manitoba, not going to take the province down. This is, this is different. But one thing, two things I wanted to point out is, one is that, yes, we, uh, Mr. Penny and I, Ron Penny and I wrote to the Premier and suggested a year ago that we should do a stop-go analysis. We should cost out what it would cost to stop this project compared with the cost of proceeding. Uh, we were told it was too late, but uh, if, you know, if we'd done that analysis, we would have saved ourselves an awful problem because if you look at the economics of it right now, and there's a person who's been writing in Uncle Nerdy's blog who's saying that we may not be able to afford to operate this project. Even if it's completed, we may not be able to operate this project because the cost, we're looking at an extra $800 million a year. $800 million a year. That's so low. That's, it's probably going to be more. That's based on the $12.7 billion. We all know it's not going to stop at $12.7 billion. So uh, it's going, we're not going to be able to meet those costs, even the operating costs. The, first, the operating costs in the first year, $143 million. The operating cost, that's, that's Nalcor's number. Uh, the export revenues are not going to come anywhere close to that. Uh, we're not going to be able to generate the revenues that are needed because what's going to happen, what's going to happen when those prices double is people are going to change their behavior. People are going to change their behavior. They're going to switch to other commodities. Two things are going to happen. One is the actual consumption of electricity is going to drop like a stone, and the revenues uh, uh, similarly. So we're not going to have the revenue. We're not going to be able to finance this project. So that's, those are big considerations here. Final point I want to make is we did have a review. It was called the joint panel. We had a joint panel of inquiry. It took two and a half years. Now, they started out dealing with both Gull and Muskrat, and midway through, they were told, it's got to be Muskrat, it's got to be Muskrat, so look at Muskrat more than Gull. But they did a very intensive process, and they made a lot of, a lot of recommendations. But you know something? All those recommendations went right down the tube. They were ignored. All the recommendations were ignored. So we had to find a way the, to prevent politicians from ignoring the, the, those recommendations. It goes back to what Sister Elizabeth was just saying, we've got to get enough people educated, educating people, uh, so that people will rise up in righteous indignation, not when the power bill comes in, in 2020. That's too late. It's got to happen before that. We, have, we need many more, we need many more Uncle Marys. We need much more um, ways of public engagement in our province to get people to understand the consequences of these actions, that people can't ignore them, can't just simply say, well, these are good times. Things are always going to be good. But come 2020, or when the project is finished, we, we're going to have to pay, pay back the, the, the debt. It, it is going to be crushing. Well, I try to answer all, all three, but we have to transform or change where power lies. So you, you discussed the fact that this was deliberate. It was, you know, what were the conditions which allowed Danny Williams to do the things he did? Same thing happened under, you know, Wacky Bennett. Wacky Bennett had no answer. Wacky Bennett controlled all the Crown Corporations. They had debts, railway throwing down plywood, or a railway on top of plywood. Nobody knew. Nobody knew the true cost until the Royal Commission study in the early 1970s in British Columbia. So I think this is a structural problem. It's an institutional problem. And if anything, the, re the inquiry needs to kind of investigate to figure out the context, the contextual factors or forces, which determine what we pay attention to, as Lisa is talking about, or what we don't pay attention to. And a lot of that has to do with the power, the power of the ideas, the institutions, and the interests which are involved and engaged in that, in that process. So we need to really have a fundamental debate in terms of transforming or changing it to ensure that the executive branch isn't dominating, doesn't have a monopoly, not only in terms of what they're saying, but what kind of information is flowing or not flowing. So, Because my biggest concern with Muskrat Falls was the, the, the deliberate attempt. Uh, how could they miss it? They, they couldn't have missed it. But we need to understand those conditions which led to the, again, this, this kind of disaster. And I think that's what the, the inquiry needs to do. It can't focus on the status quo because the status quo is what brought us where we are currently. Okay, so uh, we're, the clock is not on our side right now. So we're going to uh, take a comment from email and then we're going to go back to the panel and ask them to wrap up. I guess we're shut out. And, uh, shut out? Yes. <laughs> I'm used to it. 
Uh, and obviously there's uh, lots of capacity here and we could have, uh, perhaps we should think about having another event like this. Um, so I'll, uh, Robin, yeah. So um, th we thought that this was a, a good um, question slash comment to end with because it actually involves um, a, a constructive suggestion and a very concrete one. So this is from Barb Neese. And she says, on the question of blame, Sister Elizabeth indicated that healing requires moving beyond blame, drawing on the example of South Africa. But the difference between here and South Africa is there, apartheid had ended before they started the process of truth and reconciliation. Those with power had lost power. This has not happened here, as all of the comments about the constraints on democracy and fear here suggest. The inquiry process and terms of reference are not acceptable. Those in power are trying to set the agenda. One way to take this on would be through the establishment of an alternative people's commission and we could, uh, and we could fund it through go fund, a GoFunded initiative. Um, so. Yeah, this last bit. Sorry, yes, the last bit was um, one way to take this on would be through the establishment of an alternative people's commission and we could fund it through a GoFunded initiative. Okay. Thanks, okay. thanks okay. Robin, and thanks to Barb Nice for that. So uh, for final comments, um, I'm going to start with Jim again, and then we'll go uh, around the panel. So final comments, Jim? Yes, I'd like to see a lot more though, because I think... Uh, I'm not very good at this stuff, but as I find as time moves along, I learn, I learn more and more. So I really would like to see a whole lot more of those. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, Sister Elizabeth. I guess um, I, I come back to what I said at the very beginning here, uh, quoting the Inuit elders. We do not inherit the land from our parents. We borrow it from our children. That somehow um, we need to change the fundamental structures of a society that allows the Muskrat Falls to go off the rails the way it did. Uh, we have to change the fundamental structure of a society that keeps important information from citizens who are going to suffer the consequences. And we need a fundamental change in a society that, uh, <clears throat> that causes people to be afraid to speak their voice to power. However, we do still live in a democracy, and we, need, we've, we have this inquiry now so I think it's not the beginning and the, the end all of all of this, but my thought is that we, we might, must, every person in this room has access to social media. We probably need to flood the government offices and the commissioner's office with demands that we have more broad interpretation of those terms of reference so that we can truly use this inquiry uh, as a way to maybe address much broader issues in our society, not solely the Muskrat Falls issue, but it is so big, so powerful, so immediate in some of the issues that have to be addressed that we do have to do something about that. So <clears throat> I'm, the, commission, the, commissioner, the commissioner has to make some decisions fast and he has to ask the right questions to be able to do that. So I can only plead with every person here to use your networks and your connections <coughs> to begin to get the same energy happening on the island that is already happening on the Labrador land. Thank you. Dave? I'm going to conclude with a story. I'm gonna, my, my conclusion is going to be about a, is a story. It's a story about a letter that was written back in 2011 by my friend Ron Penny and myself. And uh, we wrote a letter to the government because the government had uh, indicated they were going to proceed with this project. And we, we were incensed that it was going to go ahead without any kind of public utilities board review. We asked a number of our colleagues to join us in a letter. None, none were prepared to come forward and sign the letter. We, we sent the letter, and we wrote a, a fairly strong letter, and, uh, but, but we waited. We waited two weeks, four weeks, six weeks. Then we got a response saying, the government's considered this. This came back from, um, from the minister of the day, Sean Skinner, minister of uh, natural resources. 
what the letter said was that uh, the government was not prepared to go all the way that we wanted them to go, which was to allow the Public Utilities Board to have a full review. But they were going to go halfway, and they were going to give us a, a reference. They were going to make a reference to the Public Utilities Board. Turned out to be a flawed reference. And, but there was a hearing. There was a Public Utilities Board hearing. Uh, Andy Wells chaired the, the board at the time. They had a hearing. And you know something? If we didn't have that hearing, as imperfect as it was, with as much information that was denied, uh, the, but there still was a lot of, we got a lot of information. If we didn't have that PUB hearing, we would have nothing. We would not know anything about this project until it was all finished, but we did. So we, the, what we did was we, we went forward to the government, we made some suggestions, we got, we got a half a loaf. Uh, so it just shows. Half a loaf, Dave. But a slice, a slice is better than nothing, Andy. Uh, but we got something out of it. So I think that the point is that citizens have to mobilize. Citizens have to mobilize in various different ways. Write letters. Do whatever you can. One of the things you can do is meet with your MHA. And every one of us should be meeting with our MHA and expressing our views on whatever, whatever bothers us. I started doing that with the new MHA. and. Uh, my new MHA, but I would recommend to each of you, that's one thing we should all do, is talk to our MHA and indicate how angry we are. Thanks, Dave. For me, it's an old debate between function versus form. And the cynical side of my career is that the executive branch is, is very powerful, has a great deal of autonomy and capacity. And if they haven't reached a sense that there is a crisis or a problem, my concern is that we probably are going to see the status quo, which will kind of carry this forward. So I think, again, I think Barb Nice has hit it head on. If we haven't had a crisis, if those in positions of power don't recognize and understand that we are in a position of crisis, and now is the time to transfer some of the power and to, to change the, the mechanisms that we rely upon in order to, to engage and to, to deal with issues and to evaluate and so on and so forth, then I think we're really in trouble. Royal commissions, if they work well, strengthen communities by bringing them together. But it works easier if there is a policy failure which is recognized as a policy failure. There is a crisis which is recognized as a political crisis. But if it is same same as, as, as the past, um, where we have, again, we are here isolated, basically government has already decided and we're debating what they've already done, if they don't respond, if they don't appeal to, to interests and people mobilizing. I remember years ago Paul Pross saying if you hear people uh, speaking out, it means they lack power in the cabinet parliamentary system. We need to transform or change that. We need to change the system so when people speak out, it actually matters as opposed to the spectators moving around by those in positions of power. So I think if the inquiry is going to work, we need to, those in positions of power need to engage, need to change the framing in terms of the questions, and they need to involve others who are affected, directly affected, and if that doesn't happen, I think that, that I, I think that it'll, it'll be a failure, and it will be a dog and pony show, and that will be, uh, I think, probably the worst outcome from, from the inquiry. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming out. Uh, thanks for your fine questions and your time and your thoughts. Uh, I look forward to more uh, events like this in the future. Um, thanks especially to the organizing team and the folks who have helped sponsor this event. And please join me, join me in thanking the panelists for their time and wisdom tonight.